Hi, Frederick. I have a question for the homework.、Um, yes. I, I don't know what does it mean to collect the data pairs from the picture. It, there's there's only one point, but we can only see one location of this ball. Let me share my screen and show you that that most certainly can be fixed. If I go here, did you see all the pictures posted? Here is my first question. No, I didn't. Okay, well then that is the first part of the answer. In the homework, I'm using the standard. Linux Unix notation where a question mark means one character, and so this link isn't a real link until you substitute a number in it, like you know thirty six, and then thirty seven, and so on. And so knowing that there are seventy one images. Most of the images are just you holding the ball. Can we ignore yeah, those? It's up to you. It's a real experiment. You be the scientist. This is、uh, with every passing year. This becomes more interesting because of how a camera of 2016 is really more and more messy compared to a camera of 2006 or whenever this was taken. But that's clearly not going to. Be any more messy than your usual data collection in any type of science. So,、um, what I advocate is that you make a file name. Let the index be one. Then say name file name. Print f. What are you gonna print? You're gonna print this web address. Then you're gonna do a 2.2i, and then you're gonna stick in the word index. This gives me one. So now, if I make a for loop, for index is one to seventy one, and I just display this file name. There's all my file names, right? So, im read. Well, that no, it is there. It is right. So if I do for index what for all of this. And then I say, Imri, an image, <clears throat> and then pause, and then end. There it is, right? So here's the first image. And if you do a pause, pause means hit enter, and it'll show you the next one. So assuming you have one image, then G input. Is going to help you collect the data. When you type x y equals g input, it brings up crosshairs. I think it's best with a mouse, but you know, you do it. So now you can collect any data that you want. You can try entering the, the center of the ball. You can try entering the top, the center, the middle. You can you could you could draw a little circle on it. You could do whatever you can to try to track where this ball is, and then find its trajectory. If you hit enter. You get a number. That's the coordinates. Okay. Let me go to one of the middle images. Yeah. So here's one. So I am not able to tell you what you make of this. You have to decide this for yourself. Where is this ball? How do you decide? Do you want to zoom in? Do you want to detect? You know, like you, you collect the data whichever way you see fit. The very simplest way is to do it very poorly and just click on the ball as best you see, and then you know at least that gives you a start. I recommend doing it poorly first and then getting it better and better. Don't waste your time trying to get the perfect data collection if you haven't looked beyond what we need to do with it. You will need to make decisions. Forty-six is weirdly smeared out. The timing of this camera is not great. Yeah. So the homework says we should find、uh, coordinate pairs y comma t is one one image one second. That we we can't. That's not true. Obviously. I think we have、uh, the rate twenty five frames per seconds. You're right, Pete. A nominal rate. Spoiler alert. 
don't spoil it. Okay. You all take a look at these images. I will tell you, and I swear to God, that I have a 3.1 megapixel Canon something or other camera, and it claims 25 frames per second. And I shot a movie and I extracted the images. And I am not in the International Space Station. I'm not at a weird angle. There's no wind in my formerly known as living room room. And it is the best I can. It is a real experiment. Oh, and I'm on Earth, right? And so you tell me what you think the acceleration due to gravity is. So that's the mechanics um, of the data collection. It's just good and bad as it is. And begin simply and then refine. And that's how the exercise is built up also. It says just do a quick estimate and try to refine it. Stick in some uncertainties. You'll have to estimate those too. Maybe you estimate model first and then go back or maybe you go back to your images or be uh, as creative as you need to get to a result. You can not use the fact that you know what the gravitational acceleration is, okay? If you're right and I'm getting about 10, which proves that I'm right, then that is wrong because you do not have this independent information. You only need to let the data decide on what it is. Clearly, in the back of your mind, you are going to be happiest if it's not a million meters per second square. But don't try to make it fit to what you think it should be. And don't justify your quality of your result with what you think it should be. Pretend you have no idea what planet we're on and just see how far you get with constraining the acceleration due to gravity right here, right now. The only physics that you can use I'm already given you, which is saying there is a quadratic dependence because Newton laws hold. That's all. How come this uh, axis here starts at zero at the top of the page and it goes down? Ah, so um, MATLAB has an axis command, which is in two modes. First of all, you do, you can, you can have things like tight and square, normal and image, but um, then there is XY mode, which is the normal mode. And there is IJ mode. Images are matrices where the top left is the first element of the matrix, the way you write it, the way we've been doing it in class. But most other data, including maps, you know, latitude goes up. And so that's XY. Of the multiple functions in MATLAB to plot things, there's plot, there's plot three, there is surf, there is mesh, there is P color, and there's image. Surf, mesh, P color, plot, plot three, image, image SC, tailed image. I pretty much think that that is literally all of the ways to plot things, okay? And um, image and image C come with the axis preset to IJ and the other ones come with axis preset to XY. So that's why. So yeah, you, you will need to deal with that too, right? I mean, this isn't pixels. I'm not telling you the aperture of my camera or the distance at which I am at, or even the resolution, even though I said it was 3.1. You got to go figure this out, uh, make a reasoned argument for it. Any more questions on that? So after we recorded the Y value and we need to, so we need to convert it into like meters. And so yeah. If you want, yes, you, indeed. If, well, here you can use prior knowledge of the size of a human hand, the radius of a golf ball. That's probably most useful. And just see where you get. So you're going to write a piece of code. You're going to have some data. That piece of code needs to be a function where you can change your ideas 
on what you are doing. The three parameters will clearly be a pixel to meter scale. That would be one of them. A you know proper time axis, but including the the very way to invert it. I say the first inversion, that's our M1 here. The second inversion has you stick in an uncertainty. We don't know what it is, but you argue what you can try and why. Then you get the sum of squared residuals. You argue what the chi-squared distribution of that should be based on the number of data that you plot, based on any histograms you generate, based on what we've been discussing. Uh, you do it again, you look at it, and you construct confidence intervals through error propagation. But this is increasingly open-ended. You gotta look at it, right? If I say construct a confidence interval and discuss your result, that means what is C of M? What is the covariance of the model parameters? which we've been discussing amply in class. And um, this book by Astor Borges Thurber, it almost takes you through a very similar exercise. So you could turn to that for some more inspiration. And I'm pretty sure Menke also takes you through a similar exercise because obviously it's the least complicated, most interesting example of doing a least squares overdetermined fit with something that is physically meaningful and that's a trajectory. Anything else? Uh, can I see your script again? The code? Yeah. Um, so the two tools are, first of all, how to make, let me read it from the inside out. This made, so sprint F is the formatted string. It's whatever you write, and then some free variables. The free variables here are literally the format string and the percentage indicates that whatever is to follow is a format string, which here is of the variety i for integers and it's gonna occupy two places and precisely two places, which means that sprint f of 2.2 i of a one is going to give you O one. That's the only way to properly sort things is leading zero. If you did 3.3, .3, you get 001. So sprint F is the first tool. Imread is just reading an image and image is just plotting it. And then the only other tool you need is G input, which if you're pressing that is inviting you to click the screen if you click with the left mouse or with the trackpad and you hit enter, it gives you the X and the Y that you've just collected. So that's how you do coordinates. You will use this many other times if you want to, you know, click more times. This is gonna be the ball, right? More or less, you would hope wherever it goes. Ugh. Now I hold on plot x, y with little black dots. That's where I click. I'll do p equals, and then I set p base color is a black Oops. marker face color. That's what I just put. I'll make them bigger. Marker size equals eight. Now I'm knowing what I want you to do. Always keep your figure on and um, remake your figure a million times until you're happy with the result. Now, this is not strictly needed here, but you get the idea. <clears throat> you want to make a composite image of what your trajectory is, go be, be my guest. You know, you're writing a report that convinces you and the reader in science that this experiment tells you what the acceleration due to gravity is and why and how sure you are about it and what the implications are and so on. What's the index you put in the beginning? So I think you're asking this here. I have this. Is that the question? Yeah. 
So I know there's 72 images or 71 images. So you begin by one. And if you have, have a loop, essentially what happens is the index gets updated. And so every time you hit a new index, you augment the number. You're not gonna write a code that has 72 lines for each images, one for each image. You're gonna write something that loops through all images, makes the name, collects the data, does that, you know, adds it to your stack and collects your data like that. Does that make sense? So you have to, you have to interact oh, possibly for the first time, a loop with a variable that reads the thing off the web and displays it. And then it requires your action to take some data off it by using G input, which is a graphical user input that produces an X and a Y. If I do two here, let me do two. I do image of that. Then I say G input, but if I'm only gonna click once, then I should say one. And if I'm just gonna add it to a set of coordinates, then I should really do it like this. Let's try this, right? So now I'm saying for every one of the indices, I'm gonna show two examples. I load, plot, do all of that stuff. Then I'm gonna click once, collect two points and shove them in a growing matrix. So keep the figure to the left. I'm in my loop. It wants me to click once. Here's my point, enter. It's slow on my machine. It's not going the way I want it. So I'll just keep clicking until it quit. There you go. I've done it twice. And now I have two points. Well, I apparently click too many times. I shall clear X and clear Y. I shall go for one. I will clear my figure. I will do this. I will plot the image. I will ask for the input. I'll hit end. Once enter, here's my second image. Click once, enter, finished. What have I done? I've collected these points. Okay, you do that 72 times and possibly 10 times because you're gonna misclick and you're gonna wanna go back and you're gonna be confused and you're gonna you wanna compare with somebody else. And so this, this is, the, there is a little art and arduosity to collecting these data points. But you'll get there. It's a real experiment. Any more? If not, I'm gonna kill it this and I'll go to my camera here. Okay, so this is where we ended last time and let me rerun what we have so far and I'm going to make sure I go through my own notes here remember the yellow box solutions and one solution to an inverse problem linear in the data depending on the data acquisition matrix the sensitivity matrix the kernel however you call it g as applied to the data, overdetermined solution. And we went and looked at it many times. And we talked about the bias, we talked about the variance, we talked about all sorts of things. Then we went to a problem, remember the little problem that wasn't really doable. And then we fixed it by inventing prior information. I'm gonna copy that for your agreeance. the word now. And there was this notion that this wasn't a great solution because it might, while it is the solution, it might lead to a matrix that you need to invert that may not be ultimately invertible because it has low eigenvalues. The extreme of having low eigenvalues is having a zero eigenvalue, which was the case that we did, which is trying to fit two primers to one point. But you will appreciate that there is, if there is an overdetermined and an exactly underdetermined as in that example, that there is the mixed determined case where you may not know exactly which parameters are really well constrained by the data, which ones are. And that whole eigenvalue spectrum of this GTG matrix is gonna help tell you that, but you may run into the situation where you just will need to add stuff 
to this matrix. And the classic, classic thing, which is often introduced by itself as if it was a thing by itself, which I'm about to argue it isn't, is to add some numbers to the diagonal of this matrix. Why? Because at least numerically it'll do, it'll do the job of stabilizing this. And then you're gonna just carry on with your day, GTD. It's also a linear inverse. It doesn't solve the same problem, it solves a numerical problem. It also solves a problem of that a problem wasn't well posed. And so that's why it's got its own in getting its own in there. Then M3 was this bit where we said, well, look, we can weight the norm. And we ended up with a weighted solution. And I think I'm about to decide that rather than keeping this W in here, I'm going to go with the argument which I didn't make very longly that the best weight to put on a data norm in order to get minimum variance estimates is the inverse of the data covariance matrix. So we know what this is. If we do it, we know the bias and the variance. We know what this is. If we do it, we know the bias and the variance. I started writing M3 with a general weight. In fact, that's what I wrote. If you carry this argument and say, well, what is that variance? And then you keep the Ws in there. And then you're trying to minimize that for a given data. Then it turns out that the best weight that you could put is the inverse of the data covariances weight. And now I'm gonna call that W3. And I have a little bit more time, so I'll just fix this. Because I didn't have time to write data minus g dot m. Okay, so now I'm writing this as gt, but now it gets an interior weight. And what is that weight? The inverse covariance. And the homework mimics this, right? The homeworks is saying, you know, try this. And well, I suppose we are, we are really just only here are we? We have just literally done this. I'm looking back and forth at my prior numbering schemes here. So let me write it and then make sure it's what I want. Dot data. Still a linear operator, still just left multiplying the data. And I'm comparing this, which I just wrote, to make sure that my general idea here of a general weight, a quadratic, both on the inside and on the left. And then I said, you know, if you choose this particular one, well, this one, then the CM variance is minimized. And then that's what you want. So that's what I have. Okay. So let me now say that there is an M4, a fourth way of solving an inverse problem. That is this combination. But you still can't do it because you still cannot have a nice looking inverse of GT times inverse covariance times G, because it still may not be well invertible. It still may have low eigenvalues because that it relates to how the parameters relate to the data and you don't know it until you do it. But you can see coming that you may have to fix it. And so you can see coming that I'm going to fix it by adding something to the matrix. And look, L squared, lambda squared I was just one example. That was a special case. It did the job, but it really was just an example. I'm reluctant now to write, I'm gonna add a lambda and so on. I'm gonna add what we really wanna add, and then I'll retroactively motivate it. So I save paper, which is in scarce supply. So I'm about to say, add something. One example is to add lambda square i, then I would have to say it's a special case. What else could you add? You could add all sorts of things. Anything that regularizes. But for all of it, you'd have to make an argument. Lambda squared i forces the solution to be small because it forces the individual parameters to be zero towards zero. 
you can think of other forcings that keep the parameters close together in pairs or in triplets or in stencils or in spatially um, connected areas or in however other way you want. That would be an acceptable form of prior information. Now I'm going to make a jump to the following and say, let me take another special case here, a well-reasoned special case. This first thing was sort of more of an arbitrary special case. This is a more reasoned special case and it adds the model covariance to the matrix before inversion and then forms with the rest of that, the linear operator. Okay, so why do I end up with that? And how do I motivate that? By going one, two, three, of course, a few sheets back, Oops, maybe too many. Well, it connects closely to what I've said before, but I think I should probably say it again, which is why it goes on this page right here, right now, is that remember each of these problems solves a slightly different problem, but begun from the root problem, which is G times M equals D find M. That's the solution. Sometimes it doesn't work, so you change it or you find a different way of weighting it, but then you're really asking to minimize a different thing. And then same thing here, you're changing it again. So the general phi, the general misfit criterion that we're using here is there always is a phi, okay? And the phi always weights the data as compared to what you predict the data should be if you have the model parameters and it's least squares. So there's a square, there's a quadratic. And here I'm writing this data space norm with all the connotations that we discussed of norminess and moments. And the fact that this is a two, two norm it involves squares and it's not the length, but it would be the length if I took a square root. So you'll see this sometimes as uh, double bars and then a two below and a two on the top and notations vary, but here it is. The, the residual, the prediction error, the misfit, all the names that you could use is just saying, well, look, I'm gonna find an M and which M do I want to find? Well, the one that when one uses an argument of phi minimizes that phi. And the general notion of the norm is that, you know, it can be weighted. And here I'm saying, we're gonna weight this norm by the inverse of the covariance matrix of the data. In other words, the precision with which you make your measurements. But in regularizing the problem, like in M2, we are saying, well, look, the data alone aren't enough to give me constraints that are proper, meaningful, unique, calculable on the model parameters. So I need to add another requirement, which is going to have to be a model space norm. That's the only other thing I have to play with. So if I say add lambda squared i to the problem, I have made the argument last time. I made the argument, but that's the same as saying, just try to keep the parameters individually close. And then I wrote quite literally that my norm was lambda squared m dot m. Here's what I wrote, norm and data space, norm and model space. I didn't have a proper quadratic. I didn't have a weight. So that was an I weight there. So now I'm generalizing this and I say, well, look, this is M dot M and special case two said that the interior weight of that quadratic was lambda squared I. And now I'm saying that this interior weight is the model covariance inverse because if I do this, that's the here that comes out there, you know, by inspection, you don't even have to do the mathematics. It comes out that way. And so I do want you to look at this with 
the right eyes, right? Burning so brightly. This is a model space norm. It's quadratic and it has a centurion rate of that. And now this is a general one. And so depending on the choice of what this interior thing was, it reduces back to the simple cases. If it was the identity and nothing, then your M1, uh, nothing being the um, one over infinity, which means, you know, no constraints on M, no prior information and no weight on the residuals, that was M1. No weight on the residuals in the data space and a norm constraint on the thing weighted by lambda, that was M2. Data covariance weight, which minimizes the variance, which is what we want, that gave us M3, but no constraints to that. So obviously M4 is the most general one, which therefore really is the one that I should be uh, boxing here and making yellow because that is by far the most general thing that you could be using. I've independently made the argument that if I use the data covariance to invert and stick into the quadratic that I get a minimum variance model parameter estimate. Now I'm adding this model norm business to it. And I didn't make an argument of why I picked the inverse model covariance to weight the norm, but I'm about to do this. And so you know that, you know, that's phi and, and the solution to the inverse problem is you're gonna find the argument over all M in this space that minimizes the phi of this argument. Phi depends on M. And in order to do any sort of minimization, I'm going to do a gradient of phi with respect to m, and you're going to minimize that by setting this to zero. Okay. And then you get those solutions. So if you're ever uncertain, start with this one and then we'll literally multiply it out. What happens when you take a gradient of that? The only difficulty I have ever with that is remembering where the transposes go. And for that, you can go back to the index notation or you could just do what I did here and essentially run back and argued it by inspection. So now I want to make two observations about phi, maybe one more actually. The first one is that, what are the units of phi? The same units as the data. But how can I be the units of the data and also have the units of the model parameter? Let's say that my data is temperature and my model parameter is coronavirus. Oh, virus. oh um, units of the data per units of the model. But how can I do when I have a plus? Uh, I, I'm saying that the, the, the model parameters in the data don't have the same units and how can I could, I could not be adding them and I'm certainly not dividing them. So let me answer the question for you. Only now is phi unit less because look, D is in units of the data. D times N is in units of the data because this is data prediction. You get that twice as units of the data squared, but you're dividing out the covariance of the data which is in the unit squares, but inverse that. So this is unitless. And same here, the model parameters have their units. The model covariance has their units, the same ones, squared. And so these squares undo each other. And only now is phi unitless. And I think it's a very important thing for all of you to see is that if we go back to that picture of measuring the relation between two parameters and I made this graph here and it's a little messy and those sums really don't make it any clearer but the definition of whole relation followed the same-ish recipe here where it says 
take my values and shift them to where I think they ought to be, that zero sentence there, and scale them by dividing to whatever is the appropriate stretchiness of variability. And that makes it unitary. And then I do the comparison and say one. But so if you remember this, and the reason too, you should see that these residuals are now expected to be zero mean, because that's really what you're shooting for. And now they're scaled to a unitless unusuality. If the residual is seven times the standard deviation of what you expect your residuals to be, because you're taking data with a noisy thermometer that's only so noisy, then that's very much tension with the model. That's very much of a misfit. That's very much of a, uh-oh, need to change the model. Same here now, the model parameters, I could make an argument that they need to be small because you know, apples and pears don't cost much or apples and pears cost about the same. And then that's the same thing. They're gonna have to scale it somehow. But here I'm saying, well, my coronavirus count is my model parameter. And I have a prior idea of what the variability is. So quite literally for this example, this would be my body temperature. This would be my coronavirus count and my prior distribution of what my count should be, there would be a mean, which I'm saying here is zero, I got to know. It's always easy to shift it. And the appropriate scale would be where do I begin by assigning myself a model parameter for coronavirus count? Now, you know, centered on, you know, and then whatever it is, a prior notion of what it could be and a prior notion of what the variability could be. But both the shift and the scaling have the effect of making this thing unitless. And that's the only way that you can functionally combine it. Everything else here requires, contains unit bearing scaling constants that people sweep under the rug and they never you know, think about it. This is the only way by which you can properly interpret the mapping of probability in data and model space. And that's by scaling it to, a, to, their, to their variance. So remark one, only now is phi unitless as it should, so that it can be combined at will. Two, only now can the relative importance of data and models be understood as a sort of a trade-off between, you know, ultimately really measurement precision and model prior variance. And I'm not making this very hard here, but, but the you know, lambda needed to be determined. So CM and CD, while they exist, they still, you could still play with them, but where you're playing with them, you have to play with them in with respect to one another. Three, what am I reading here? Uh, I've used the word. So CD, I want to think about that as a measurement precision, right? It's the variance, covariance, make it, of your thermometer and your subsequent you know, ways of measuring my temperature. So sigma D times I would be one way of saying I'm using the same thermometer and I have a completely independent measurement every minute of it. Or I could say I have a diagonal covariance, which would be every time I measure your temperature, I'm in a different state of mind and that shapes my uncertainty. But at least from one day to the next, I have no relation with my previous measurement. Or your CD could be a completely correlated matrix, a completely full off diagonal having element matrix, which would say, look, there is a complicated dependence and relation between the various measurements that I take, depending on the time of day and, and who does it and what instrument I use. And so I have all of that information. If you don't have it, you begin by ignoring it and then carrying through what the implications are. If you have it, you use it on the same thing. So CD is a measurement decision. So that is your prior on the residuals, your prior 
belief of what the data residual should be is that you happen to be nearly zero and their variance is just going to be the precision of your instinct and any correlation. And so CD is that, and so CM is the model prior. It's what you think the model parameter should be in the absence of having made any measurement. And that's back to the naked worm, right? The naked worm says it's probably cold out there. That's a prior on the model parameter. And it's going to make a model of the earth by saying, yep, yeah, that's what I got. It's cold out there. Then it pokes its little head out and takes data and the confrontation of adding information from the data and folding that into a missing function and make a new model is completely changing your prior belief. Fourth remark, I'm using the word prior. You bet you I'm going to bring Bayes back, right? Watch for Bayes. And we'll be seeing soon enough that the Bayes version of doing these inverse problems is trying to get to say, well, now having done this, what is the posterior on the model of parameters? How much is my posterior change with respect to my prior? And so on. So that's going to come right back. And then five, when I write quadratics, I really imply, ooh, and I have one word left for it. Tell me if you can't read something. I realize you have to be quite small. I'm going to read the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Only now is phi unitless as it should. Two, only now can the relative importance of data and models be understood as a trade off between the data covariance and the model covariance because the relative size of these things, you know, clearly influences what the sum is. Three says that the data covariance is the measurement precision. This is not new, right? This is just translation of old words. Your prior on the residuals, the prior variance covariance information that you have on what the residuals are is that it is the data precision. It's your instrument telling you how well you do. And that doesn't mean it's independent, it means identical, but you know, that's what you've got. You have it, you use it. And then it says that the model covariance matrix right here is what I use as my prior information about the model parameters that I want. So that's the model prior. As I've written this, I'm saying, look, I'm using the word prior. I'll be using the word likelihood for this. And I'll be talking about my posterior. So I write watch for Bayes because the base theorem is clearly involving prior's likelihood of the series. And then five says quadratics imply, what could quadratics possibly imply? Something about error. Yeah, it implies something about error, but it also implies something about the parameters, right? All I'm saying is, look, I have chosen a particular form of measuring the tension between data and prediction and between models and their own. How about I change it? Okay, I'm gonna make it slightly even more general. I'm saying, look, here, M, of course it's measured against zero because there is no zero. Let's make a model parameter and compare it to a prior value of the model parameter. This is gonna be seriously more clear. Okay, so the unspoken truth was that I was comparing that M zero was, you know, zero as in it could be a perturbation. That's why I usually think about that. But so there's a prior value in the model parameter. And now I'm saying, find a solution and see how odd it is that my solution should be this far from my prior. But don't go units on me, but measure distance to wherever I thought I should be landing as scaled by however certainty I had about how far it should be landing, which is the inverse covariance of it. And so I, I like this is this is the most important equation of the whole thing here. You know, it sums everything up that we've done so far, beginning with shifting and scaling and notions of units and so on. And so here here I clarify that. So now I'm saying look 
this is a quadratic. It implies something about the errors and the distance from what you think they should be. They should be at zero if you're doing it well, and they should be scaled properly. Same here, this implies something about the model. But the fact that I choose a quadratic form, I want you to make one connection that we haven't made yet. What is choosing a quadratic form implying? The only other word I'm thinking of is normalization. I'm gonna stop you at normal. Okay. It implies normality. It implies Gaussianity. Why does it imply Gaussianity? Well, and so normalization is too stretchable of a term. You can, you know, like it clearly comes from that, but you're right, right? So I've used that word in that context, right? Standardization by shifting and variance scaling. That's a normalization. Why the word? Because it makes it normal. What does normal mean? Gaussian. Now it's called the standard normal or the norm. So that's all in the same thing. If I say Gaussian, Gaussians are measuring distances this way. There's an exponential. There's a shift with respect to where you should be, the location. Squared, though, and scaled by the inverse variance right? That's a one parameter Gaussian. So remember the book by Bennett and Pearson that I keep uh, pushing upon you. Chapter three. Remember the whole hierarchy of the distributions, the uniform convolved gives you the Gaussian, the Gaussian squared gives you the chi squared, the chi squared divided gives you the S the um, slight modification of the Gaussian is the T distribution. And then we have probably just about had it. And I did this, I did change of variables. We didn't talk about moments and characteristic functions. Chepichep equality is interesting. Two random variables we definitely did. The distribution of the sum variable, we did that. That gave us the convolutional rule. Gaussian, here's the Gaussian. Okay, all the same things. Ah, the joint Gaussian, which I haven't specifically done, but I am doing it now. That's for a specific correlation coefficient. This is 353 is a particular form of a Gaussian distribution for two variables that are correlated in a certain way. I can't remember this, I can't write this. This is too complicated, I never remember that. Plus I don't like to remember special cases. So I scroll down to 69 page, 363 though. I don't particularly like the formulation, but I'm seeing things I like. You will start recognizing that it is still just X versus mu where you expect it. So there's a distance, it's still a quadratic and then it factors out this covariance matrix. And honestly, I do not like the form of it, but it's the first clue, okay? And uh, then, you know, the unfortunate result is there's too many, you know, equations that don't add any more knowledge. So I quit there. And so I think this is exactly why we are in class because books with their conventions and so on, you have to either read them all or you have to have somebody like yours truly point out what's important in these books. But now the multivariate case. So where I'm definitely gonna end up, I'm gonna end up, what is a Gaussian? Well, there's an exponential. There is a squared, in the exponential. There is a normalization factor. And there is a particular form in which it weights the interactions between the particular components. So let me write the best form here. I'm trying to look up what my proper form is. I call it P. I'll complete it in the next lecture, but what are we seeing? So far it's proportional because there's a constant, which I'll work out. There is an exponential. I'm to write it in a, trying to write it in a form that is as close as possible to the single variable case that we've been having, right? 
I want the exponential of something. I'm going to call it x. But now x is a vector. So what is the joint distribution of the vector x is what I'm getting at. And that is going to be this x vector compared with the first parameter of where you think x should be. And uh, let me call it capital mu. Why not? This is a Greek capital mu. And it's a quadratic like before. So here's that. And what goes in the quadratic? Well, the inverse covariance matrix, which now I'm going to call sigma capital. Okay, that's more than halfway there. And then the normalization is going to come out by dividing this by the determinant of this matrix. And I will need to check one or two factors because I'm not entirely sure that I have normalized it already. But I just want you to start recognizing this thing that it's in a very, very similar form as before when we had just one variable which compares the x to the mu. It squares it. There is a negative sign. It divides by the standard deviation squared, which is the variance. And this is another unfortunate notation that which I've alluded to many, multiple times. The big sigma is the variance covariance matrix in this case. And the diagonal elements of big sigma are little sigma squared. It's just the sad reality of notation. So of all these x variables, these are all their little variables, x1, x2, x3, and so on. And then all the correlations, or rather covariances, one, two, one, three, and so on. So why am I writing this in conclusion? I'm writing this to illustrate the fact that quadratics imply Gaussianity because look, I've been waiting, I've been forming distributional arguments of data compared to predictions which you want to be zero in their difference and in which you want to wait by the position of the measurements. That implies that the multivariate variate distribution of the residuals is a multivariable Gaussian with sigma given by the covariance of the so-called data and m is where you expect the data. Well, under the linear model, you expect the data where your linear model tells you where they are. And so that's G times the model parameter, and then some normalization. But it's exactly the same for the model norm. It says my model parameters, the prior idea that I have is that they're given by a certain value and then a distribution around it. And here too, that would be a distance of a vector M to uh, a prior vector M zero and inversely weight by all the interaction terms and then properly normalize. And then the last thing is that I'm gonna start there next time, maybe. You take a log of this, you're, you're just seeing the terms, right? And so we are going to uh, get, bring all these elements back together with base, the likelihood, the log of the likelihood and then trying to maximize posterior distribution of the model parameters by minimization, the negative log likelihood of these terms here. And then you'll see that we end up at the same point. And that's why it's all so consistent. So I will pick this up here, but the lecture is over.